So now let's look at the past and the future. Starting in the abiotic. In the abiotic world, the dynamic physical laws that we have make no direction of time. Time passes, but the formulas work exactly the same when they move to the future or to the past. If you have a differential expression for the evolution of some physical system, does it matter whether dt is positive or negative? We can run our projections forwards or back. But there do exist thermodynamic laws of physics that have a direction in time. That time is related to what is called entropy, a measure of the amount of energy unable to do work, a measure of disorder. These relate to the flow of heat from higher to lower temperatures. So let's take an example. If I played in reverse a video of planets orbiting some other star, you wouldn't know that the video is going forward or backward. You wouldn't know it's in reverse. But if I showed you in reverse a video of an ice cube melting in a cup of tea, you'd know that it was backwards if you saw that in reverse. A cup of tea doesn't get hotter while spontaneously forming an ice cube. Briefly, under these thermodynamic and tropic laws, the direction is towards states which have more ways of being. There are more ways to have a warm cup of tea than a hot cup with an ice cube. There are more ways to have air spread around a room than there are ways of having it all condensed in a bottle in the corner of the room. If you open the tank, air would come out. It wouldn't go into the bottle. This is the direction of time in the abiotic in a very brief nutshell. Now, in biology, there are several types of time. There is metabolic time. Think of just a few hours. You eat food, you move your body, you excrete waste, you breathe in oxygen, you breathe out CO2. There is generational time, which is the time of reproduction. And there's evolutionary time when we think about tens of millions of years. The direction is clear. As one example, over generational time, trees can move across a landscape, even though an individual tree doesn't walk during metabolic time. But as it reproduces, it spreads. Over evolutionary time, life doesn't just change. It's not just different. It advances. And this can be measured in, for example, the number of elements used by life. This can be measured by the flow of material and of energy. The energy flux density of life increases. As an example, mammals use more energy than reptiles for body mass, and especially per generational time. And mammals can have more specialized biological processes due to the fact that we have a controlled temperature. We're warm-blooded, unlike a reptile whose temperature varies much more. Another biological example over evolutionary time, a process called cephalization, which really just means the formation of a head, this has drawn life towards a concentration of nervous processes in one place. We have senses, we have a brain, etc. And these advances, these are just a few examples, have overall allowed life to exert an increasingly powerful effect on the chemistry of our planet. If we look at the era of evolutionary time, the tendency is not towards states of greater probability, as it was in the abiotic, but towards states of absolute impossibility. This is the opposite of entropy for giving a direction to the arrow of time in biology. So evolution has drawn life towards new, let's call them biological technologies. The chemotrophs, living off of sulfur emitted by hot vents in the ocean floor, very early life, hypothesized to be having existed for quite some time. These creatures cannot photosynthesize. They don't use light. But now, with the advent of photosynthesis, we have an atmosphere that is one-fifth oxygen. Life's development of photosynthesis isn't in the direction of a greater probability of these deep-sea chemotrophs, but is the creation of a new technology, a new way of generating energy that was impossible for the previous level of life, the previous platform. With photosynthesis, the potential population density of life on the planet soared. In life, past and future are not just opposites, like left and right in Euclidean space, or a positive or negative dt in dynamical processes, in dynamical physics. For life, the future reaches states that the past never could have. Let's apply this to cognitive time. 
For us, think through the difference in your experience of past and future. And now, can you remember the future? Can you change the past? What is now in your experience? Do rocks have a now? If there weren't people here expressing our free will, how would some then in physics differ from now? What makes this moment different from another? Does a rock know the difference between now and 10 minutes ago? A new aspect of time in this phase space. A few other parallels. Life has become increasingly independent of its surroundings. Life has increasingly shaped its surroundings, the biosphere. We bring into being new synthetic environments through the infrastructure platforms that we create. And this is how Lyndon LaRouche saw economic infrastructure, not as a collection of pieces of rail or roadway or power lines, but as representing as a whole a certain level of technological understanding and of social direction in implementing it. An economic platform changes the physical economic space in which economic processes unfold. A difference between us and life over evolutionary time would be that unlike all other life, we create these seismic shifts, these epochal changes in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when a fundamental discovery is born or communicated. We embody in our minds a process that takes the mere biosphere millions of years, and we are endowed with a now that allows us to willfully change the future and also the past by drawing meaning from it. That process of change, that is the truest substance of the universe. We start with what we see in our cognition, not from the abiotic. So. In improving our economic abilities, by increasing our power over nature, we use more energy, more resources per person, and that is good. We also create more resources per person. We create energy. The laws of thermodynamics do not apply to the human economy as a whole. The Malthusian green cult believes in an entropic world in which fixed resources are consumed. They say that progress and development must be stopped. But this is unnatural. This goes against the development of the arrow of evolutionary time and of cognitive time. I conclude. We have a role as the only known form of cognitive life in this universe to expand the process of development initiated by the abiotic universe, the formation of the solar system, then the development of the biosphere. We have a obligation to create a more prosperous, joyful, beautiful, and purpose-filled human society. Such efforts will bring a measure of justice to the past and the future of the lives of Lyndon LaRouche, Vladimir Vernadsky, among the billions of people who have lived and who are yet to be born. Anti-entropy, growth, is our mission as the human species. I would like to share with you my ideas about the relationship between the development of science and present state of our society. And probably I will uh, start with uh, uh, similar things that were described uh, in the first presentation. Uh, about the uh, academician Vernadsky, uh, who uh, I uh, consider that this idea paved the way of what I'm doing now, especially two things. He uh, was one of the first scientists uh, which um, developed the science of the nuclear physics in the field of uh, uh, radium studies. Uh, he was director of the Radium Institute in the St. Petersburg. And I am now uh, working with uh, Radon, we, which is daughter product of the radium and um, 
plays very important role on the modification of the uh, lower layer uh, of atmosphere and uh, contributing to the lithosphere atmosphere ion sphere coupling which i will describe a little bit later on and the um, last thing it is uh, his ideas of the geospheres interaction uh, on which our model is based and um, one of his very interesting and important ideas it was idea of no sphere uh, this term was proposed a little bit earlier by the french uh, scientists uh, edward leroy and priest uh, pierre uh, telhard but the uh, professor Mernatsky merit is that it filled uh, this term with a materialistic content uh, showing uh, the knowing the laws of nature and improving technology begins to exert a decis decisive influence on the course of processes on the earth and the near earth space changing them with its activity but uh, in many uh, countries and especially in the western uh, world there are a little bit um, primitive understanding of the uh, geospheres interaction if you look at the right part of the pictures they uh, only show the biosphere atmosphere geosphere and hydrosphere uh, forgetting completely about the space uh, effects on our environment, which is a uh, place decisive uh, role in development of our nature and society. And the second uh, very important thing that biosphere and especially uh, mankind uh, being is uh, very fragile because if you look uh, at the uh, left part of the figure, you will see that the uh, position of the biosphere it is uh, very thin, uh, very skin, skin of our, here you can see skin of life, because the, these 20 kilometers where uh, the uh, living uh, beings uh, exist uh, is even less then the uh, skin of our body uh, looking from the perspective of the environment and we should be very careful to uh, maintain the conditions of our life do not lose the possibility of the future and uh, um, next uh, you can see that uh, the interaction of the geospheres is much more complex because we have uh, impact from the above, from the uh, sun, from the galactic cosmic rays, uh, and then it, uh, energy of the uh, sun activity is transformed into the energy of uh, our magnetosphere which creates the uh, large number of different currents and fields in our environment in the ionosphere in the atmosphere and uh, many physical events are influenced by the solar activity for example um, the industry objects like a uh, Hydro, uh, hydropower stations can be influenced by the solar activity probably you remember uh, this uh, disaster in canada in 1989 probably uh, well uh, when the old province ontario was uh, without electricity uh, during uh, during the whole day from another side we have influence from the seismic activity or on the our environment um, and this activity is projected uh, not only into the atmosphere but into the ionosphere 
and even magnetosphere and modifies our environment and we will see this if we look carefully on the global electric circuit uh, where we live uh, we continuously are inside the global electric circuit and on the ground surface the vertical electric uh, field or gradient of the vertical electric field is 100 volts per meter so between your um, legs and head you have uh, nearly 200 volts uh, uh, difference and uh, this uh, uh, global electric uh, circuit is modified by many factors uh, by the galactic cosmic rays uh, by the uh, air pollution uh, uh, by by the natural radioactivity and for example uh, the uh, galactic cosmic rays contribute to the formation of the uh, clouds and so we have relationship between the uh, action of the galactic cosmic rays and uh, our uh, thunderstorm activity uh, here uh, you can see the uh, so-called uh, called Carnegie curve it is a UT variation of the this electric field on the ground surface and uh, in the right side you can see the distribution of the thunderstorm discharges which are mainly concentrated all over the continents and in the summer uh, hemisphere this uh, thunderstorm activity higher than in the lower uh, uh, hemisphere but what is interesting and uh, very mysterious that uh, this daily uh, electric field activity is uh, uh, has a very large correlation with the global seismic activity and uh, looking in the cause effect relationships uh, we can state that probably the seismic activity controls the uh, uh, thunderstorm activity on the, our planet. Bernatsky called this this new era that we have entered, where science is primary, the era of the noosphere. Bernatsky was also preeminent organizer of science. In Russia during World War I, he took the initiative to organize the Committee on the Study of the Natural uh, Forces of Russia, which would bring together existing knowledge of strategic war materials and gather new information about Russia's resources. But I would like to focus today on Vernatsky's Ukrainian side, given the events that are going on in that country today. In particular, I would like to upset the apple cart of a myth that the present Ukrainian government is pushing that they have never been a part of Russian culture and history, except perhaps as victims. Pushkin Street today is now becoming Stephen King Street, Gagarin Street is now Neil Armstrong Street. Put, uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace can no longer be taught in Ukrainian schools because it praised Russia's army in its fight against Napoleon. Napoleon. What a travesty. What a, a total impoverishment of cultural life for young Ukrainians. And what a distortion of real history. And unfortunately, we in the West have largely been following suit in our restrictions on Russian singers and artists. The St. Petersburg-born Vladimir Vernatsky loved Ukraine. His family had its roots in the Zaporizhia Cossack region of Ukraine. His parents were both born in Kiev. They were fluent in, in Ukrainian, a language which Vladimir uh, taught himself. His mother sang Ukrainian songs at home, and much of his creative and revolutionary work and the study of living matter was nourished in Ukraine and its flourishing natural endowments. While Ukrainian culture and language was often banned by the Russian empire, Vernatsky and many other Russians supported Ukraine's desire for autonomy and the rights of its culture to develop. In 1918, Vernatsky, then at a summer home in Poltava in Ukraine, on a sabbatical leave, from St. Petersburg due to the Bolshevik Revolution, 
uh, received an invitation from a Ukrainian colleague to come to Kiev to help organize the intellectual life of the region. Ukraine had been lost to Russia in the peace agreement signed by the Bolshevik uh, government with Germany. Ukraine was thus then under German occupation. But Vernadsky had already participated in many discussions earlier in St. Petersburg with Ukrainian colleagues discussing the possibility of creating a Ukrainian Academy of Sciences as part of the St. Petersburg Academy. So Vernadsky accepted the invitation. He himself had done extensive studies of the history of the academy movement in France, in America, and in Russia. His view, however, was that in this new era, when scientific thought had become a geological force, uh, a different conception of the academy was required. It must not simply be a gathering of noted scientists coming together to discuss scientific questions, but rather must serve as the basis of a Man Manhattan-style mobilization of the entire intellectual forces of the nation to lift the country to a higher level. His proposals envisioned the creation of an aut autonomously elected academy, which would have the full backing of the government. Under it would be a national library that would accumulate all the available intellectual material vital for the life of the country in all languages, books, manuscripts, musical notes, literary remains of important intellectuals, etc. It must incorporate the works of world culture and be open to the world. At the same time, there must be set up as studies of Ukrainian literature and culture and a commission appointed for the creation of a dictionary of the Ukrainian language. The library must be open to all and free of charge. Uh, the Academy project would also subsume a national program of education and research an agronomical institute, a chemical laboratory, an institute for biological studies, a meteorological observatory, a mineralogical museum, and a museum of history. Vernadsky also created a, an institution like he did in Russia for the study of the productive forces of Ukraine. The proposal for the creation of the academy was accepted by the government and Vernadsky was elected its first president. One must keep in mind the instability of the political situation in Ukraine at the time. During the period of the organization of the academy, namely 1918 to 1920, there were more than three governments in Ukraine. When the Germans left after their defeat in the West, a radical nationalist government took over, later to be overthrown by the Bolsheviks. In addition, like today, there were a number of Western nations hovering around Ukraine waiting to see who would get the choice bits of this heartland country. France, Britain, Poland, Romania, but especially the British were predominant as Vernadsky himself indicated. But the academy lived on through this political turmoil as did Ukraine, which then became a part of the Soviet Union. Vernadsky also brought in people from the Russian academy to help with the organization of the Ukrainian Academy. And given the way that Ukrainians during the Russian Empire had been relegated to simple Ukrainian studies, the bulk of educated, educated scientists were Russian. Vernadsky would use them initially while preparing Ukrainian aspirants that were beginning to come into the science fields in education. One can even say that the basis of Ukrainian nationhood had been laid by an individual who is the foremost representative of Russian science. If Ukraine could return to this tradition, it would help to undo the damage that has been done by the Anglo-American divide and con conquer policy, which has pitted Ukraine uh, against Russia in NATO's proxy war.